Court, Catherine Watchers from the Attorney General's Office here on behalf of the Commonwealth, the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, and the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. Your Honors, this is an action by the Town of Boxford to attempt to force MassDOT to shut down a salt storage facility in its town, a facility that provides a critical public safety function and assists MassDOT in its de-icing operations along Interstate I-95. Well, we've got two critical public functions, right? We've got clean water, because we certainly don't want the, co the Commonwealth to be carrying out public functions in a way that injures the health of the public. Absolutely. And is right. there any doubt that the salt water facility has been contaminating the wells? Well, I think there's a couple different issues, um, Your Honor, and, and some of this, I think, gets confused in the town's papers. There's the issue of um, what contamination may have been occurring in the past versus contamination happening presently. And respectfully, the Commonwealth submits that there's no evidence in the record that today the salt shed is causing any contamination. There were a series of improvements to the salt shed back in 2005, an extension that was built in it over the salt sheds to allow all the loading and unloading of salt to be um, conducted under cover to prevent any um, salt from getting into the I, I saw that. I couldn't quite understand why under cover was going to stop the leaching. I mean, I would have thought they'd put a floor on or something. I mean, Well, I think there, there already is a floor. There's already an asphalt floor. Um, that's preventing the salt from leaching inside the facility. I think the issue was that as the trucks were pulling up to the facility, the loading and lo unloading originally was done um, outside in the elements, whereas today any loading and unloading would be done over, over cover. I, I, take it, I take it none of this matters because you would say it doesn't matter whether the stuff, whether the repairs were made or not. You can't stop us. Uh, ex exactly, Your Honor. Well, so, we would, we would is, and isn't it a fact matter? I mean, it's a factual matter to determine whether there's still leaching. But it you're is, saying it doesn't matter one way or the other because you can't stop us. It is a factual question. It's a question that uh, absolutely I think this court need not reach because as a matter of sovereign immunity, the Commonwealth cannot be sued um, absent consent. But it, can't, it surely can't be the case that, I mean, it may be that you can't be sued, but it surely can't be the case that the Commonwealth can continue to be causing a known hazard to the health of a large number of people and that nobody can stop it? Well, a couple things, Your Honor. I don't think it's the, it's the position that nobody can stop it to the extent that a private landowner, for example, has a particular issue and a potential cause of action against the Commonwealth. No, no, no. The, the private landowner is doing this just the way the Commonwealth wanted it to do it. I, I'm just saying. I'm you sorry, know, Your Honor. I just missed that. Uh, Justice Cordy said, you know, I understand your argument that it doesn't make any difference what the facts are, and I'm just saying perhaps it does make a difference for some purposes because if the Commonwealth is engaging in, in mm -hmm. conduct that it is established is impacting in a powerful negative way the health of a large population of people and simply says, too bad. You know, we're going to keep doing it this way because we've got to salt the loads and we're in an economic downfall and this is the most efficient way and we think it's important to keep the loads salted. Essentially, as I read the Commonwealth's position was, too bad, nobody can stop us. That can't be the Commonwealth's position, surely. Respectfully, Your Honor, that, that, that is, I think is an extreme view. No, no, but it's the view that the Commonwealth is asking us to take. We're, we haven't waived sovereign immunity. You can't sue us. You can't enjoin us. You can't tell us to do anything. We haven't waived it. it. It certainly is the Commonwealth's position that under the Chapter 111, Section 122, and Section 31, that the Commonwealth hasn't waived its sovereign immunity under those two particular statutes. I don't believe the Commonwealth has ever said that um, essentially we don't care about the situation. In fact, I think... No, no, no. It's not a question of care. I'm sure they care a lot. I'm just talking about salt. But, you know, forget about whether they're out there doing other kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, essentially your position is even if salt was continuing to leach in large quantities and contaminating the wells of this entire population of people, too bad <coughs> if we decide we want to keep salting the roads. Isn't that your argument? I believe that is the argument, Your Honor, although we would disagree that the record supports that the salt shed is presently causing any contamination in salt into the groundwater. But do you, but it's, it's but do you want us to decide this case based on the factual, based on the view that factually there is no risk of current contamination from what they're doing now, or do you want us to decide based on the view that no matter what the state does, even if the state is poisoning the children of Boxford by what they're doing, that Boxford is helpless to do anything? 
I don't think this case, um, as a, in the current posture, could be decided on a factual um, determination. Our argument is, is a legal argument based on sovereign immunity. So you're saying that we have no choice but to essentially say that no matter to, to what extent uh, Mass Highway is poisoning the water in Boxford, and even if it were not merely salt but something more lethal than salt, you would say Boxford can't do anything. Under the particular statutes that the town has tried to sue under in this well, case, well, yes. What's, well, no, but sovereign immunity, you, ha you haven't waived <laughs> sovereign immunity. So even if they came in under something else, what could they come in under something else? Well, it's, uh, arguably, um, it, as I indicated earlier, um, perhaps a private landowner may have a potential claim under Chapter 258, or there, there may be some other cause of action that, that I'm not aware of. So, so are, are you saying that... that that uh, there would not be a defense of sovereign immunity if a private individual had brought this claim, but there is a defense of, of sovereign immunity because the Board of Health is bringing the claim? Well, the, the issue, Your Honor, is what's the claim here? What's the cause of it's action? It's a nuisance. Well, actually, in terms of the complaint, there's four statutory causes of claims, and the first two are under Chapter 111, um, Section 122, and Section 31. And, and isn't one, one of the things that the, uh, the Board of Health is empowered to do is to prevent nuisances? Uh, and, and one of the ways they can prevent a nuisance is to bring uh, an equitable action for injunctive relief, exactly the same thing that a private individual could have done who's downstream of, of, of the salt pile. And, and, and you're saying that if, if I take it, that although a private individual uh, would not be barred uh, <coughs> as a result of sovereign immunity, the Board of Health bringing exactly the same claim, essentially for the good of all those people, is barred by sovereign immunity. The, the, board, the board is barred by sovereign immunity, Your Honor. And I, I think it's, it is a, it's a, a different claim, although arguably based on similar uh, factual background, we're, we're talking about two statutory causes of action here. Um, in addition, if the, the town, I don't understand to be alleging a public nuisance claim, but if they are, that no, cl no case to date has allowed a public nuisance claim against the Commonwealth. So there's, there's absolutely no precedent, precedent for allowing that, that type of claim to go forward. But is it a good public policy to allow the Commonwealth to do something that harms its citizens and just say there's nothing you can do about it? Respectfully, Your Honor, I think that the record, even the record on appeal here, although we recognize this is a legal issue, the affidavit submitted by MassDOT and before the motion to dismiss and motion, the affidavit submitted in opposition to the preliminary injunctive relief below demonstrate clearly that um, that, that factually, that that's not actually what's happening here, Your Honor. That MassDOT has worked with the town and the um, the private residence owners for years regarding contamination issues. Has taken many actions to um, to work with them to protect to protect them from the, any kind of contamination from the salt shed. Has worked with them in terms of replacing wells and etc. And as we sit here today, it's it's. It's respectfully, it's something of a red herring to target the salt shed as being the problem when there's no evidence in the record that at today the salt shed is causing any problems. There may be problems arising from the salt of the local and state roads, and that's part of the reason why MASTA has implemented a low salt zone in the Boxford area. But that is a distinct issue from the Boxford salt shed. But you don't want us to even allow uh, anyone to get into the merits of that because you're saying, well, we're immune from suit, so you can't even get into that. That's correct, Your Honor. That is That's what I'm position. asking you about. Is that a good public policy? Well, uh, respectfully, Your Honor, I think that that is, that is a good policy, and there, there are important purposes for the Commonwealth sovereign immunity. Um, not only to protect the state's treasury, but protect the state from disruption of being hailed into its courts to defend itself. You just said a private person could do it. Sir, the if, town just has to find a private person and do the same thing. I mean, you're not protecting the state from anything <clears throat> then, are you? Well, I think it is a different kind of ac action to have a city suing the state why? than it is a particular well, wh private Why from a sovereign immunity point of view? 
Well, from a sovereign immunity point of view, the legislature has determined that under, for example, Chapter 258, that a private individual may maintain a negligence type cause of action against the Commonwealth. That's something that the legislature has considered and already decided. That's a different issue than what's before us here today, which is the town of Boxford trying to pursue a cause of action against the Commonwealth under statutes that were never intended to apply to the Commonwealth's actions. So to get back to Justice Gantz's question, although I know it's awkward for you to keep saying this, you do not want us to decide the basis, to decide the case on the basis that factually there's no risk to the Boxford residents from the salt shed. You do want us to decide the case on the basis that the Commonwealth has sovereign immunity and Boxford can sue, and if somebody else can sue, you don't know about that. Maybe yes, maybe no, that's not why you're here. You just know Boxford can't sue here today. So even if the record were clear that the salt shed was causing the contamination, the web, that's beside the point. Respectfully, Your Honor, I don't think that this court needs to reach those factual determinations, yeah. that, that it is a legal question of sovereign immunity. Right. To the extent that the record is sufficiently developed that the court could reach those factual determinations, I would suggest that the trial court um, erred and abused her discretion in determining that any contamination would be today resulting from the salt shed. What, what are we to make of the, the very first clause in, in Chapter 111, Section 122, which empowers the Board of Health to examine all nuisances. Mm -hmm. I mean, does that not include the Commonwealth? Does not include the Commonwealth, Your Honor. Um, typically, you know, this statute, for example, refers to whoever violates any such regulations. To, the references to persons and whoever in a statute are typically um, found in this case law that supports that those are not um, meant to apply to the Commonwealth. And in particular, um, in Mastod's case here, under Chapter 6C, um, the, statute specifically uh, the sp statute specifically states that references to person and whoever do not apply to Mastod. So the same reasoning would apply here. Um, in addition to that, there's nothing in this statute that would indicate a waiver of the Commonwealth's sovereign immunity or an intent by the legislature to waive the Commonwealth's sovereign immunity. Um, do you think that the... Um town uh, could regulate, forget sue, but could regulate mass dot in this regard? Uh, respectfully, Your Honor, I, I, don't, I don't believe so. No, I don't believe that yeah, the town same, would have the authority to do that. Same, same issue? Same issue, unless there was an explicit, um, you know, uh, something in a, the statute that indicated that the statute would apply to the actions of the Commonwealth, then the, perhaps so, so that would the be. So when the judge cites authorities for saying that the, um, uh, you know, a, a town can regulate as long as it doesn't interfere with the essential governmental function, mm -hmm. which she considered to be a fact issue that was down the road. What's wrong with that? Well, what's, what's wrong with that primarily in this case is that it, it, in our view, it confuses the issues of sovereign immunity with the issues of the essential government functions. And um, although the court above, below purported to apply the essential government functions test, the court um, disregarded the Commonwealth sovereign immunity, and um, in this case, sovereign immunity prevented suit. It was so, it's a different issue. So, but let's just say it was just regulation. That's what I'm trying to get at. Could, okay. could the town regulate? In Mastod? the context of a lawsuit against Mastod? Not a lawsuit. Just say do something that would the regulation would be something that made it impossible for uh, the Department of Transportation to use or run its salt shed the way it has been doing? Mm -hmm. uh, I would say no, Your Honor, and I think that there's case law. Um, historically, there's numer numerous cases that explain that a municipality typically um, may not regulate the Commonwealth in this way, that they're exempt from these sort of um, local regulations. How about state regulations? I mean, what if, what if the town of Boxer were to say that you're in violation of DEP regulations? Uh, and perhaps that would be an issue of DEP's enforcement against um, MASTA. Okay, so basically you could violate, I mean, the, the position you're taking essentially is the state may violate the law and regulations and local regulations and the common law of nuisance, and there's no remedy for the town of Boxford except, except via the political process. I'm sorry, by the... Via the... Uh, the political process. They can, Throw the they can go to the governor and they can have the governor order you to do something else. 
That's it? Respectfully, Your Honor, again, I would suggest that the record doesn't support there's a violation of any of that. But the principle you're asking us to apply would apply even if you did. I'm not suggesting that all that I'm, that my parade of horribles occurs here, but the principle that you're establishing, I gather, would apply even if that parade of horribles existed. I believe so, Your Honor, and that's sovereign immunity. Is there such a thing as selective sovereign immunity such that, I mean, it really almost becomes a standing question, but that while the state acknowledges that it could be sued perhaps by the Department of Environmental Protection for this kind of activity, and perhaps even by private citizens who are directly affected by salt flowing into their wells, but for which there is no sovereign immunity defense, but sovereign immunity nevertheless will apply as to the town, even though the remedy that's being sought is exactly the same in all the cases. I'm not sure that the remedy would be the same. An equitable remedy. Well, I think in an individual case, an equitable remedy would relate to an individual's property, whereas in this case, the equitable remedy sought is essentially in order to shut down the salt shed. Potentially, the equitable remedies could overlap. I'm sorry, I don't think I've answered your question. No, I think you did. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Thank you very much, Your Honors. Good morning, Mr. Corbo. Good morning, Your Honors. I represent the town of Boxford. Could I just ask you a question right off the bat? Yes. Excuse me. Who gave permission to the highway department to build this salt shed there? I don't believe that anybody gave the highway department. Put it this way. Maybe this is a very, very naive question, but if the Commonwealth wants to put up a structure to do something that comes into a town and the town's got zoning, you know, residential, does the Commonwealth have to go through the normal procedures? Under zoning? Under what? Yeah. I mean, it wants to put up a salt thing. You know, it owns some land right next to my residence in a residentially zoned area, and it wants to put up a salt storage facility, you know, with the trucks coming in at 4 a.m. when, you know, the weather reports are bad and bright lights and lots of noise and clanking to say nothing of contamination. Can the Commonwealth just do that? Is it immune from that kind of regulation? Under your recent decision in the case of MBTA versus Somerville, the answer to that question is no. So there's some regulation to which the Commonwealth is subjected. That's correct. As most clearly enunciated in the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District case, the Commonwealth is subject to regulation by municipalities, in particular anti-nuisance regulations such as the types of regulations we have at issue here, as long as those regulations do not interfere with the Commonwealth's essential governmental function. And as you found in the Greater Lawrence case, whether or not a particular regulation impermissibly interferes with an essential governmental function presents a question of fact to be determined at trial. But you're not. Those were not, that was not a sovereign immunity case, was it? Nor was the MBTA case a sovereign immunity case. That's correct. And neither is this. Okay. The doctrine of sovereign immunity applies to private causes of action brought against the Commonwealth. This is not a private cause of action. This is a statutory regulation that the Boxford Board of Health is exercising, and it is a statutory cause of action in that Chapter 111 gives this court and the Superior Court the authority to enforce the Board of Health's orders. So you're saying, and I apologize for not knowing this better, but you're saying that because a municipality, although it isn't the state and it's a creature of the legislature, but since it's not a private party, sovereign immunity has absolutely no bearing on what it does. There may be other limitations on what it can do vis-a-vis the state, suing the state, but it's not sovereign immunity. Is that your position? That's correct, because what you have here is you have two statutory mandates, two essential governmental functions. On the one hand, you have the statutory mandate of MassDOT to build and maintain the roads. 
On the other hand, you have the statutory mandate of the Board of Health to eradicate nuisances. And in particular, in Chapter 111, Section 122, the authority of the Board of Health to regulate nuisances is not limited to persons. It doesn't say no person shall cause a public nuisance. Rather, it's more in the affirmative in that the Board of Health shall examine into all sources of nuisance, causes of filth, et cetera, and shall eliminate those nuisances. The only time person comes up is way at the end when it's talking about criminal penalties for violations of those regulations. And that's not what's at issue here. We're not seeing criminal penalties. I understand, but the reason why I said we've established that they are subject to regulation. Subject to regulation is a little different from subject to suit, though. I mean, it may beg the question of what happens when the regulations are violated. But you're making that leap. You're just saying subject to regulation and subject to suit are the same thing, and I'm interested in how you can make that leap. Well, I think you have to make that leap. For the later sections of Chapter 111, give the court the authority to enforce orders of the Board of Health with respect to nuisance. If you interpret that as not permitting the board to bring a suit to enforce against the Commonwealth, then you're effectively taking away the authority that they've been given to regulate, because the authority to regulate without the authority to enforce those regulations is nothing, because then we can issue a regulation and MassDOT is free to ignore it without consequence. Would you draw a distinction between a suit for damages as opposed to a suit for equitable relief? Yes. And why? Well, under this particular case that we have here, I don't believe that Chapter 111 gives the Board of Health the authority to seek damages against anyone. I'm just trying to think of conceptually. Conceptually. If the town had a... Let's just say the statute did permit to say, you know, it can regulate, and if there's a violation of the regulation, the town can obtain adjunctive relief and also damages for whatever remedial actions the town may have. I mean, that's a not bad statute. It happens not to be this statute. I'm conceptually trying to find the path into which we go here. Sure. So then you would be coming to the Commonwealth to say, pay for our testing, pay for the remedial work, assuming the statute allowed it. That gets us closer to the problem, right, of sovereign immunity. It may sound like it gets you closer, but it really doesn't. I mean, if the Board of Health's mandate is to eradicate public nuisance through injunctive means or physical means, and the statute authorizes them to collect compensatory or monetary damages, then I think the case is no different. What you still have is an entity created by the legislature seeking to enforce a legislative mandate, and it is that scenario that takes it outside of the realm of sovereign immunity, regardless of the nature of the relief that's being sought. So I assume that the state operates out of almost all 351 cities and towns in some respect. So they are subject to whatever nuisance regulations those individual boards of health might decide to enact and have to defend themselves in courts when those boards think they haven't acted appropriately? That's okay? That doesn't interfere with sort of the Commonwealth's business? Well, as long as they're conducting their operations in a proper fashion and they're not running afoul of their legislative mandate, they shouldn't have that concern. But you're trying to shut down the – you're not just trying to regulate the flow of salt. You're saying that – well, I don't know exactly what you're saying, but it appears that there can be – there can be no salt storage facility. You're flipping the burden of proof. You're saying don't operate it until you show me that it doesn't contaminate. I think – isn't that what you're asking for? That's correct. And it's not that there could be no 
salt storage anywhere in the town of Boxford. It's just that they can't stall short, <laughs> store salt at this location. But that was why I started mm -hmm. off by saying, under what authority are they stalling it here? Because if it's, if it's subject to regulation, and if, I mean, maybe you don't need a license to regulate it, it to store salt. I mean, it may be that the town, I mean, this may not be in this record, but it may be that they, ha they were in a non-residentially zoned area, in a you know, light industry or some other zoned area, and they had the right to do it. Well, this isn't a zoning question. This no, no, is, I understand that. Um, this is solely on nuisance. We're not arguing that because of, of zoning that this... No, no, I understand that. You sure. said it might, they could m maybe do it someplace else. I understand it's not a zoning question. It's, right. the, it's the appropriateness of the site for storing salt, correct? That's correct. And somehow, when it's not the Commonwealth, I can't imagine most of us being able to construct a salt storage shed in any town in the Commonwealth without somehow engaging in a discussion with the local zoning board or the local town. I would agree with, with that statement. I'm not aware of any particular licensing requirements, but um, that's not really what's, what's at issue here. Well, well what, what is, even under zoning, what does the state have to do if it wants to, for instance, put an administrative office three stories high in a residential area? Um, is, is it entitled to put, regardless of zoning, um, a, a, uh, any kind of a uh, or use its land for any purpose it wants, but it may uh, be required to have certain screening and setback requirements. There is something in the zoning statute about that. Yes, that's, that's correct. I mean, you'd have to apply to the building inspector for, for a building permit and you know, show that you meet all of the dimensional and setback and, and use requirements of the, the zoning bylaw. You mean you're not entitled to, the state is not entitled to use land that it owns for any purpose it wants, subject to certain setback and, and uh, bulk requirements? N not under the, the MBTA case. Under the MBTA case, um, zoning bylaws apply to state entities, again, with the limitation of not interfering with essential governmental function. And, and that's sort of, I think, what the the key to this is, is that... Well, it is, it is the key to it because you make the leap that if we can regulate, and as long as it doesn't interfere with an essential government function, then I must be able to sue. And it's not clear to me that that leap is necessarily established in our law. And the two cases in which you refer were not suits against the Commonwealth. I mean, I can understand the... the it seems ridiculous. Well, how can I regulate if I can't enforce? It might be that you have to negotiate. It might be that you have to have resource to the political process. But our case law is pretty clear that unless the Commonwealth explicitly says, and you can sue me, and you can sue me, uh, that we've been rather hesitant to let the Commonwealth be hauled into court unless it has said, yes, you can do that in these circumstances. Well, in, in this instance, what we have is the, the subsequent provisions of Chapter 111 that gives the court the authority to enforce the orders of the Board of Health. And, and in effect, the court stands in the shoes of the Board of Health and looks at the regulation and determines whether or not the regulation is proper or should be enforced. And if the court can enforce that regulation as to a private party under a grant of statutory authority, then it should also be able to do so as to the Commonwealth. Mr. Corbett, what have other states done? I mean, sovereign immunity is not unique to Massachusetts. Where there is an authority recognized for a state, um, or the federal government for that matter, to regulate, um, and there's a claim of sovereign immunity when there's a claim of enforcement. I mean, what do the treatises say? What do the other people say about this? I'm not aware of what the other people are saying. Um, your decision in, in Greater Lawrence um, spoke very clearly over the, the authority of boards of health to impose anti-nuisance regulations. And, um, no, no, I don't think, I didn't even hear uh, Ms. Watts was saying you can't regulate, well she actually did say you can't regulate me, I take that back. She did say I couldn't regulate her, but, um, but, but not, I didn't push her on that. But. I don't think that's an issue here. Whether you can sue to enforce the regulations, there is an issue. 
and, and again, I would go back to um, the, the definition of sovereign immunity in the Lopes case, in which it specifically states that sovereign immunity bars private causes of action. This is not a private cause of action. This is a statutory cause of action, which puts it on a different footing in a different plane. There are cases that stand for the proposition that a municipality can't sue the state, for the, not as a general proposition, but for various things. And I'm not going to remember what they are, but you will. And I'm just wondering, what's the difference? Uh, I'm just trying to think <clears throat> of an example where it's, it says it's the creature of the legislature and, you can't, and it doesn't have the right to challenge something that the state, maybe it's to, to challenge the constitutionality of a state regulation or a state statute. Oh, oh, well, those cases would, would be different, right, because the, a municipality doesn't have constitutional rights per se as an individual would have. So it has and, nothing to do with sovereign immunity. It's just that it isn't a per, it isn't it, just what you said. It doesn't have the, those. Well, that's rights. correct. And you know, the, the other cases that, that kind of come into this, this area here, um, and my, my sister alluded to this, were um, the, the cases in the public nuisance cases, like um, the, um, the Hub Theaters case, um, and there, there was one other where municipalities tried to bring um, public nuisance actions. And what was significant about those cases was although the municipalities were not successful in bringing these public nuisance actions, it was because the, the legislative created entity or the, the state in those cases was carrying out its function in a non-negligent and proper manner. So one of the cases involved the operation of an airport. And the finding that, that the municipality could not maintain a nuisance action was based on an explicit finding that the, there was no evidence that the airport was conducting its operations negligently or not within So it was a factual proper. determination. That's exactly. It was a factual determination. Whereas here, we would say there is ample evidence, or at least there will be a time of trial, that Mass Highway is not operating this facility in accordance with its legislative mandate. Did, did uh, Mass Highway uh, have to obtain any kind of a state permit to operate this salt pile? Not that I'm aware of. That's what I keep okay. asking. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Corbett. Thank you.